We're going to start our chapter on learning to name and write chemical formulas. The symbols of the four elements constituting matter, according to Aristotle, were water, earth, fire, and air. Certainly would be easier to write chemical formulas if that's all there was to it. Later, elements were given symbols from the planets, the seven metals and the seven planets. Gold was the sun, silver, the moon, and so on. You can see that platinum was a combination of gold and iron, and the symbols were a combination. So this was getting closer to what chemical formulas might be. Here are some other compound symbols of the time. There's vinegar and lime and other common compounds, sulfur. Again, each of these symbols were a combination. So it looks as if sulfur is a combination of aqua and other substances. Later, John Dalton came up with some chemical symbols and formulas very similar to what we have today. If you look at the symbol for hydrogen, the circle with the dot, and then later look at the symbol for ammonia, which is the combination of hydrogen along with the symbol for nitrogen. And of course, ammonia's formula, which you'll learn later, is a combination of nitrogen and hydrogen. It is not in this ratio, but he certainly was getting closer to the chemical formulas of today. Chemical formulas are simply symbols that show the kinds and numbers of atoms. A molecule has a molecular formula that can be represented as a structure or a symbol formula. Structural formulas versus molecular formulas. Structural formulas you will learn to write later as we move through chemistry. They give you a little more information than the molecular formula. This is the computerized version of your structural formulas. This chapter deals in the beginning with the formation of ionic compounds. Ionic bonds form between metals and nonmetals by a transfer of electrons. Why do compounds form at all? What would make rust, which is iron 3 oxide, form when you bring iron and oxygen together? The driving force for all chemical reactions in the formation of compounds is that the compounds are usually more stable than the elements that make them up. The periodic table shows us all of the elements, and most of the elements on the periodic table want to have the same number and arrangement of electrons in their outer orbitals as the noble gas that is closest to them on the periodic table. Ionic compounds, again, are going to be the bonding between a metal element and a nonmetal element with the transfer of electrons. The cations are the metal ions that lose electrons to get a positive charge, and the anions are the nonmetal elements that will gain an electron to become negatively charged. These positive and negative charges will then pull together with electrostatic forces of attraction. Most of the elements will try and achieve this stable noble gas arrangement of electrons. And for ionic compounds, they're going to do this by gaining or losing electrons. Later, with covalent compounds, we will look at sharing of electrons. But they still want to get that noble gas arrangement of electrons. So as the electron moves from the metal atom to the nonmetal atom, forming these positive and negative ions, 
and the opposite charges hold the ions together, then a more stable arrangement is formed. Transfer of electrons, positive and negative ions forming, electrostatic forces of attraction pulling the ions together in a low energy stable arrangement called a crystal lattice. An ionic compound is a compound that results when a metal reacts with a nonmetal to form cations and anions. Ions, atoms that have gained or lost one or more electrons, cations will lose electrons, your metals will form cations, your anions will gain those electrons, and you will form ionic compounds. When you name a cation, you simply name the metal atom. And at the end, you add ion. So Ca2 plus is the calcium ion. Na plus 1 is the sodium ion. And aluminum plus 3 is the aluminum ion. Anions have their names changed by removing a part of the atom name and replacing it with IDE. Chloride, sulfide, and nitride are all anions. The periodic table is going to tell you what the charges will be when these elements gain or lose electrons. Everything in group 1 will lose one electron to become positively charged with a plus one charge, and then group two elements will have a plus two charge, and we will go over this in much more detail in class so that you really understand why these elements obtain the charge that they do. The transition metals, those in the center, will have various charges, and writing formulas with those will be a little more challenging. But all of the other elements have very predictable charges, and eventually you will simply know group 1 has a plus 1 charge. Again, we'll go into the theory behind why that occurs in class. As sodium transfers one of its outer electrons to the chlorine atom, they become more stable in their ion form. The ratio in which they form or bond in this compound is a one-to-one -one ratio. One sodium ion with one chloride ion. Not all ratios will be as simple as one-to-one. -one. In this formula, Sodium wants to give up one electron, and chlorine wants to form the chloride ion by taking that electron. All ionic compounds can be called salts, and their simplest ratio of ions are called formula units. They are not called molecules. These are not molecular compounds. They are ionic compounds and they are either called ionic compounds, crystal lattice structures, or formula units. We're going to start with very simple formulas, two elements only, called binary ionic compounds. I'm sure you learned to write these in the eighth grade. We'll do a quick review and then move on to more complicated formulas. When you write a binary ionic formula, you always write the metal ion first. Once you write the ion, you determine its charge. 
aluminum is going to have a plus three charge. That means it's going to lose three electrons in order to form a stable electron arrangement. When it bonds with bromine, the bromide ion is going to be formed when it gains an electron. So for every one aluminum, you're going to need three bromide ions in order to have a net balance of charge. So the charge from the aluminum will come down as a subscript for bromine, and the charge on bromine will come down as a subscript for aluminum, and a 1 is never written. So the net balance charge for aluminum and bromine is AlBr3. With calcium and phosphorus, calcium is going to want to lose two electrons, and again we'll discuss this more in class, but when it loses those two electrons it forms a stable arrangement of electrons. Each phosphorus atom wants to gain three electrons. In order to transfer an equal number, or six electrons, you would need three atoms of calcium for every two atoms of phosphorus. When those electrons are transferred, you then have three calcium ions and two phosphide ions forming the formula calcium phosphide. When you name a binary compound, it's quite simple. You name the metal ion, same as the metal atom, and then you name the nonmetal ion, the same as you name the regular anion, by changing the ending slightly and adding IDE. MGS would be magnesium sulfide. CABR2 is calcium bromide, potassium nitrite, aluminum oxide, and of course strontium phosphide. Formulas for transition metal compounds require a little more work because their charges are not given on the periodic table. Unlike the other metals on the periodic table, the transition metals don't achieve a noble gas arrangement of electrons in order to become stable. They become stable by different arrangements of their electrons. We're going to go into more depth when we actually learn about the bonding that takes place with these transition metals in class. You have to be told or you have to determine the charge on the transition metal element in order to write a chemical formula with it. You still always need a charge in order to write a formula, but you can't get this off of the periodic table. The transition metal ions that you're required to know are the following. Iron 2 and iron 3 ion, copper 1 and 2, tin 2 and 4, and lead 2 and 4. There are many other transition metal ions, but you are not responsible for memorizing those those you will be given in class. The transition metal ions that have only one charge, you also need to memorize. That would be zinc with a plus two charge and silver with a plus one charge. So again, while you can look up the charges on the alkali and alkaline earth metals from the periodic table, and you can look up the anion charges as well. You cannot look up the transition metal charges. So how do you know what they are? Well, their charge will be given to you in their name. So for example, copper with the Roman numeral 2 in parentheses is copper 2 chloride. That means that the copper ion has a plus 2 charge. You can see that that plus 2 charge was carried down to the chloride ion so that you get the formula CuCl2. Let's look at iron 3 chloride. Again, the Roman numeral 3 means that the iron is carrying a plus 3 charge in this formula. And that 3, again, was carried down to the chloride ion and the one of the chloride ion, of course, carried over to the iron. 
or FeCl3. Iron 2 sulfide, the iron has a positive 2, the sulfide ion carries a negative 2, and you get the formula FeS. Lead 4 bromide, the lead is carrying a plus 4 charge, giving you PbBr4. 10 2 oxide, 10 with a plus 2, and the oxide ion with the negative 2. Remember, if charges are equal and opposite, you never bring them down. So that gives you the SNO formula. 10,4 nitride, the nitride ion with the negative 3 and the 10 ion with the positive 4 give you the SN3N4 formula. Iron 3 sulfide is Fe2S3.